today, at this time, is the easiest time in history to make the criticisms that you are making, not in history necessarily, but the easiest time in 100 years, um, or perhaps 70, to make the criticisms you're making. But they are only somewhat valid, or only perceivably valid now, because of huge corruption. It is exactly in the places where Enlightenment principles, classical liberal principles, are being eroded. Exactly those places where problems are arising, and exactly in proportion to how those principles are being eroded. Wherever there is a rigged election, there are corrupt and illegitimate leaders. Wherever free speech is suppressed, there are bad ideas predominating, etc., etc., etc. These ideas do actually work. They are the correct way to do it. Now, I, w I could broach some idea of non-universal suffrage, maybe something like family units, because of course it's, it's historically valid. That's about as far as I go, though. Anything else gives too much power to too few people. And if you let the government decide who is allowed to vote, no matter how you spin it, that's a terrible fucking idea. Um, Patricia's weighted voting is one, more complicated, so less transparent, and two, still has the same balance of problems as non-weighted voting. Any more complex voting system that you try to use has a different set of exploits, but is more complicated, so harder for people to understand, and thus harder for people to spot fraud and issues. So don't bother. Just have one-to-one -one voting. Of course, one-to-one -one voting within a region, and then regions can start voting because geographical alignment, geographical um, uh, separation is a sensible way to divide up the voting because geography makes a huge difference to what the priorities of the voters are. It also means that um, uh, population density is not a guarantee of certain ideas becoming popular because it's not really about the number of people um, that matters about what a nation should do. It's about the number of different types of people, the number of interests. But any attempt to, um, to judge that is going to be uh, biased. And so the simplest and stablest way that we have found to judge that, which is actually useful, which actually works, is regional voting. And it's not perfect, but it's a lot better than, than just total popular vote, because then cities just predominate. So that's how you do it. Like all, none of this is perfect, but it's all the best we've found just about. Um, and uh, it is it is still the best system with a few variations. Like, you know, European systems have a few differences, and on balance, they're about as good. Um, I think the US and the UK have the better the better systems in the world, um, with both being good for different reasons. <laughs> Ronald Thumbs is neat point. However, fancy crown under democracy, everyone can have a crown if you want one. You can you can have one if you want it, because democracy is correlated well with capitalism. It works well with it, and. Um, Capitalism uh, provides plenty every time it's used, pretty much. Why are you defending the bankruptcy of the system of democracy, you said Patricius? Because it's not bankrupt. The problem isn't democracy, my dude. The problem is corruption. The problem is precisely the opposite of democracy. The problem is that when you have corrupt people who rig and cheat a democratic system to get into a position of power, they convert that system into an oligarchy, which is similar to what you're asking for, I assume. You know, a, a monarchy is a, is a very small oligarchy, if you like, if you include the court as well. You could argue it's a sort of an oligarchy. Not exactly, but it's pretty close. But a, a democracy is, is only becomes like an oligarchy when, when the people's ability to hold the politicians accountable is eroded, which has happened today, by a combination of propaganda through, and also information control, part of the same thing, and uh, actual vote rigging. If it is the best system, why did Europe stop using it? Why for 800 years did the people of Britain push towards a more representative system? <clears throat> the parliament begun in, uh, although um, Magna Carta was 1200s, I think, and parliament was not long after that, in some form, obviously limited to start with, <clears throat> but it became bigger and bigger and more powerful. Why is it that democracies have, I think, never or very nearly never lost a war? Like, I believe it's like, Advanced Western democracies have never lost a war. Um, the, it is the best system. Now, it's not categorically different than monarchy. And this is important. Monarchies are just a less advanced form of democracy. In democracy, you have the same basic principle as monarchy, the same basic principles and ideas, but we agree on more rules, which makes the system easier to run and flow better. You can do more with it. You can solve more edge cases that come up in monarchy. It's just more 
flexible, more versatile, more usable. It takes more to keep it up, but we also are more attenuated to issues, so we fix them quicker. Um, that's a topic of a video I was going to make, actually, that monarchy is not terrible. It's just worse than democracy. It's just a less advanced form of democracy. Everything you want in monarchy is available in democracy, just in a different way. In, in almost always, it's better, in fact. It fixes issues that existed with monarchy for hundreds of years. Patricia says every democracy is built to be corrupted. Well, so is every monarchy. Every system faces corruption. In fact, corruption is, on the most zoomed out timescale, useful. Corruption breaks stagnation. The universe abhors stagnation more than it abhors corruption and will use corruption to break stagnation. Corruption is the uh, the um, decay period of the cycle of growth and decay. It's a natural process. Every system will go through it. Fucking planets go through it. Weather systems go through it. Entire galaxies go through it. This system is, is constant throughout the universe. Um, democracy will do it just as much as monarchy will. Monarchy justifies itself by divine right of kings or by some other notion, usually religious in history. Mon uh, democracy uh, justifies itself by the people have a vote. There's not much difference there. They just it, any any system needs to self justify its authority, um, and no justification is inherently um, uh, uh, categorically better than any other. Though I prefer to have the ability to vote and that to be the justification than to not have the ability to vote and have a religious justification, because I'm not religious and a lot of people aren't. And to clarify, as Nazi says, the word democracy has different connotations, especially if you're an American, um, because republics and democracies are a little bit different. They're similar, but they're a little bit different. And when I say democracy in this, contract, in this context, I'm including republics in that. Now, I know there are differences, but I think both the UK and the US systems are valid ways to do a democratic system. And while the US system, by some definitions, is not technically a democracy, in the context of this conversation, when we're talking about democratic systems versus a monarchistic system, the Republican democracy are a lot closer to each other than to monarchy. And so I classify them both under the name democracy. Just so you understand, I'm not ignoring the differences between the UK and the US uh, systems. He says, democracy is an illusion. Well, I mean, it's, it's abstract. It's a game we agree to play by, just like having a king is. He says, because people need to organize to actually do shit, it's, so basically it's always an oligarchy. Not necessarily. Um, if you have a stagnant age, you can get a, essentially a, 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 a de facto oligarchy forming. And if you have very corrupt politicians, they can rig the system by propaganda or by literal rigging to maintain an oligarchy. But People always pay attention to that. Just like if a king is a bad king, the argument for monarchists is, well, just kill the king. Sure, yeah. People will pay attention to these things. They always have. Otherwise, our society would not have got this far. The problem is that if you need to kill your king, if you and a bunch of farmers say this is wrong, you take up your pitchfork. I'm talking medieval context here, but it applies the same in, 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 in modern day. The barrier of entry to kill your king is a hell of a lot higher and the barrier of entry to put a different piece of paper in the box this year to organize other people to do the same thing. And so you will suffer more oppression before you do something about it. Think how anal people are about the tiny differences of policy today with politicians. Think how little it takes for them to change their mind. Certain people, not everyone, and most people vote for, the, vote for the same thing. That's stability, that's valuable. But for some people, think how little it would take for them to vote for, at the very least, a different politician in their preferred party. How specific the differences in policy are these days between the different parties compared to in the past. It takes a hell of a lot less to change who, you, who you're voting for than to kill the leader of the nation. And you could, you could gather people to, to support your cause much easier if it's that easy to do something about it. It may take more people to do something about it, but then that resists against unjust rebellions, just as you wouldn't want your opponents today to have more power than they deserve. They don't want you to have more power than you deserve, and you don't get to say that you deserve it and they don't, because then they'd get to say that they deserve it and you don't. Unless you want to do violence, but then they could do violence and maybe they have more access to it than you do. And we just, we don't do those things because it, it leads to a more stable society. And you haven't done violence yet, so I assume you agree. Monarchies, especially feudal ones, are eugenic. Um, there's some truth to that, uh, but they can also fail to be eugenic. Um, parents will want their children to be competent, but will they always? Will the firstborn be a psychopath at some point who doesn't care about their offspring? 
Will the fir- will the firstborn uh, be indolent merely as a as a product of uh, genetic chance? Bad monarchs are at least as common in history as good monarchs are, or, or, or monarchs that are not as good as the best at least, you know, or not even close. Um, and you have to deal with them for eighty years or until you kill them. You know, eighty years, a rough estimate, but a long fucking time. A bad prime minister or president, five years, uh, and then you convert them out. Uh, or at most two terms in some countries, uh, in most countries. So 10 years in the UK, eight years in the US. And then you can get rid of them. You, granted, you have to be rid of them. Uh, but you know, that's the only downside is that if you have someone that's really good, then you can't have them in for too long. But it's kind of fair if the other side really doesn't like them, you wouldn't want that same treatment from them. Um, and having people who stay in office too long has other problems, which is why we have term limits, which I do think is a good idea. With, you know, if you vote for a bad leader, yeah, granted, but you don't have them for that long. But if you have a, a monarch, then you have them for a lot longer. Um, and the people get to choose who they want. And so what if you have a genetic line that was the right line for making valid leaders 400 years ago, and they're just still in power? Well, in a democracy, they get cycled out in... 10, 20, 30 years. It can ju- like, aside from all the other benefits of democracy, it just moves faster as well. Culturally, it can change faster according to needs. And the rate at which things are changing today absolutely requires that kind of speed. He says, the thing is, the Athenian democracy was in fact just a way for the Athenian nobles to roll off their responsibility on the public. It may well have been, um, but I don't think that's how modern democracies are. Um, and if you think they are, then vote for different representatives who won't treat it that way, which is what's currently happening. The uh, MAGA wing of the Republican Party is by no means perfect, but it's doing pretty well. It's better than I would have expected you know, 10 years ago to see an uprising like this. It's, it's surprisingly principled and surprisingly capable. They choose not to let NGOs and globalists and whatever else control how they vote, for the most part, and they are getting into power. They weren't in power at all 10 years ago, and now they are a significantly influential force, led by the currently most popular president in the US, in the history of the US. Tell me it's not working. You can't do it. Patricia says, the reason I do not do violence is because it's not effective. Uh, Well, okay, I get that you may not agree with this, but that does make my argument for me. Uh, you you, You have justified my case at least as well as I could have done myself. Patricia says, well, in feudal societies, upper class overproduces offspring compared to paupers. Okay. Uh... Does that, does that um, indicate anything? Like that happened for hundreds of years, thousands of years, and then the result of that chose democracy and has not gone back. If we're going to talk about eugenics, there's your answer. If you think that was a mistake, well, then maybe it was just genic, <laughs> the process for choosing it. Maybe it wasn't as good as you thought. Well, because it's, that's their incentives. It doesn't have to be. If you get a... Uh, proud enough populace and determined enough people. Like, again, you're speaking as if the political representatives are always psychopaths. Now, for the last 30, 40 years, way too many of them have been psychopathic, in my humble opinion, and have been doing only what will make them personally money. Do I think Pelosi's a psychopath? Absolutely. Do I think Biden's a psychopath? Absolutely. Do I think, I'm not sure about Obama, probably. Do I think Hillary's a psychopath? Bloody absolutely. This is why they're called lizard people, because psychopaths have more lizard-like brains, physically speaking, evolutionarily, taxonomically speaking. Um, but the people in MAGA, the actual representatives who are getting into office, I don't think they are. And psychopaths are driven by pure self-interest and, 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 and greed and, and you know, what they can grasp. Normal people, and especially uh, like responsible thinking people, um, and especially like practical thinking people, like most of the Marga lot, are not motivated primarily by pure self-interest. They're motivated by much more indirect forms of self-interest, um, like uh, pride, like honor, like um, dignity, uh, and, and uh, wish to avoid shame uh, by what's morally right, sometimes by religious codes and things like this. And if someone is motivated by those things and gets into office, they're not just going to take Soros' money. Some of them may, but I haven't seen it happen yet. Most, all the market people so far that have gone to office, as far as I know, are doing what the people essentially want them to do. And that just wasn't the case 10 years ago. It just didn't exist 10 years ago, or not with this kind of influence. 
you really like even if you think democracy isn't a good idea you have to admit that it's 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 doing something the, the process of self healing has begun it is evident Patricia has never said that we even can go back well fair enough you can still advocate for something even if you don't think it's going to happen um but if you're talking about eugenics if you're saying that you know generations upon generations will generally choose the right thing you have to admit that generations upon generations of monarchists eventually chose democracies Patricia says we Germans wanted to go back overwhelmingly. I'm not sure what um, you mean by that. When was like did did was there some sort of uh, national poll and Germans said they wanted to have a monarchy instead? I I don't know of that, but that's interesting. I wonder how long ago that was. Even if it was recently, I, I'd still dis disagree. He says, did you not see the damn study that found out that Western democracies do not actually care for public opinion? Again, you're talking about one. You're talking about a study from scientists who have all kinds of biases, especially when we're talking about social sciences. I wouldn't trust that for a second. I trust my own judgments of these situations better than I trust a bunch of fucking social scientists. But even then, um, there's all kinds of ways that could be confounded, especially the fact that up until about five years ago, I would agree that most uh, modern Western democracies were not functioning properly because of corruption, because of stagnation. The things that I am literally on these streams to talk about, they had problems. They were not working properly. They are undergoing the process of repair right now. It's slow because our opponent have dug their heels in very hard, but it is working. If what you say is true, that democracies don't actually care for public opinion, then that's something to change and something that is being changed right now. But also, what does that even mean, care for public opinion? You've got to be careful with that. Because if you're talking about public opinion in one sense, you could mean, do are our politicians terrified of what the press will call them and so become slaves to the press? I don't want that to happen, but that could be how they measured it. Did you look into the methodology of the, of the study? I wouldn't trust a single study to, to wipe my ass with, to be honest. He says, what the fuck is healing? IQ is dropping one point on average by decade. Again, you're analyzing this on the basis of taking all the years of stagnation and corruption and saying, well, there's a problem. When I'm saying, okay, but the last five years, we've started to see improvement. That is the healing. Any study that you find that takes into account anything before that is going to be messy because of that. But the five years, roughly, that we've been seeing healing, actually more like eight years now since Trump, that we've been seeing some healing of the system is nowhere near enough time to actually uh, uh, get some sort of longitudinal result. We have to understand it as it is and try and extrapolate forward. But it's definitely an upward trajectory in some areas. But this is what you should expect to see. You should expect to see things getting worse in many areas before they start getting better. The issue that you talk about with IQ, that is literally being caused by the corruption that we are trying to deal with, the corruption that is potentially being healed right now by political actions being taken by people who agree mostly with us. And the IQ issues you're talking about specifically are probably demographic, not actually um, like raw intelligence issues. It's demographic change, which is another issue that we are arguing against, an issue that corrupt politicians are bringing about, partly, I think, because, for example, which group of people in the world are most apt to authoritarian rule and have the lowest IQ? Middle Easterners. Oh, look, it's the Middle Easterners who were imported into, the, into Europe. Almost as if the people that did that wanted a pliable population that was uh, open to authoritarian regimes like feudalist monarchy and have a low IQ, because obviously Asians are open to it, but have a relatively high IQ. Relatively. So that's who they imported. In the US, it's a little different, but Mexicans do have generally, I think, a lower IQ and maybe are more apt to... Um, but I think mostly they're, they're, they're just a, a conduit for fentanyl from, from, from China. It's a different game over there, but it's, it's similar principle. It's demographic change for the side benefits, for only for the powerful. And also, of course, the cultural clash is to try to melt down the culture to sabotage our nations. The, um, the clash with the working class to try to get them fighting in amongst each other, trying to make them, trying to make people racist, I think, as well, so that they're fighting about that rather than looking at the real source of the problem. This is why that's happening, specifically because of corruption, because of people who get into power who, one, don't represent what the people themselves want, and two, have bad intentions for the country they've become powerful in. People have not been vigilant enough for the past 30 years, roughly, or more, arguably, but for the last five years, the vigilance has been rising steadily, and it's actually, we're actually seeing results from it. 
He says Germans never did. Well, what do you mean then? He says, in Weimar, most Germans voted openly for monarchists. Well, I could understand that. Quite honestly, I could completely understand that because in Weimar, Germany, they had a failing republic system. They were aware that monarchies had worked in the past, so it's a safe option. And the world was a lot less stable back then. The US was pretty successful uh, as a uh, republic, um, but Germany had a republic. So they thought, well, this is what a republic is. But I'm sure that's not really what a republic could have been. I'm sure it was highly corrupt as it was. I think maybe they were making the same mistake that, that with respect, I think you are, thinking that, well, this is, a, this is a republic, so republics must be bad. Let's just go to something else. When, in fact, it is a bad example of a republic. Same as there are plenty of bad examples of monarchies that you're, in my humble opinion, completely ignoring. He says they wanted to prove that Western democracies were good and found out they kind of do not care. Again, there's so many ways that is confounded. And one of them is that, yeah, that used to be true, but it's not as much anymore. So we're just making stuff up. No study can be trusted. No, we, we <laughs> I didn't say no study can be trusted. I said forming a political opinion based on one study, which is a study about social science. You're a social scientist, Patricia. You generally put stock in what social scientists say about the world. Me saying, I don't think that study is right, or I don't think you've interpreted that study properly, or there's any number of ways that study could be um, incorrect in practice, is not to say science is bad. Let's not take it too far here, Patricia. I'm saying that there are many reasons to think that that study is not the sole and only arbiter basis to form an ideology on. <laughs> or at least enough to denounce an ideology. And obviously, like, there's so many things wrong with it, and you should be able to see that. Like, science is not the process of trusting an authority, my friend. Science is the process of finding the truth, even when the authorities are wrong. He says, we didn't, we were almost put in camps for not taking a damn injection. Yeah, because of corrupt politicians who wanted money and wanted control. Like, I've discussed why that happened many times. Corruption is a thing. Corruption was a thing in, in monarch, uh, monarchistic systems just as it is in democratic systems. It always will be, probably. It always has been. Our job is to repair those problems. But if a similar situation had arisen 500 years ago, then I expect the oppression would have been worse and would have lasted longer before people started doing anything about it. It's caused by social systems being invented. They literally, on G I don't know what that means, but social systems being invented, monarchy is a social system. We are always going to invent more social systems. Some of them will work, some of them won't. And sometimes something that didn't work 100 years ago will work today in combination with something else we've recently invented or some new conjugation of a bunch of ideas. We need to constantly re-examine these things, which is why it makes sense to have people like you who re-examine all this stuff and believe that monarchy is a good idea because you have to advocate for it just in case it is, but in fact it isn't. Most new ideas are bad, but we need to keep coming up with new ideas because some of them are good. And if we didn't come up with new ideas and adopt the good ones, we would not have left. Not caves. <laughs> that's, that's, a mis that's a misconception, but we would not have left, you know, pre-civilization um, stage of development. And socialism is a social system as well. It is a bad one. People advocate for it regardless. Um, monarchy is also a social system. Democracy is also a social system. And, you know, uh, democracy used wrong can be bad. Socialism used well is still bad. Monarchy used well can be good. But in my opinion, not quite as good as democracy used well. I'm not saying it's a huge difference, but democracy is overall a little better. Patricia says it was corrupted from the start. I don't know what it is in that case, but no. Um, you will tend to get uh, peaks and troughs. You'll get golden ages and then declines and black ages or whatever when you call it, corrupt ages, stagnation, corruption, and then rejuvenation back to a golden age again. This cycle is, I mean, it's a fucking sine wave, my dude. It's, it's completely fundamental. It's, it's all throughout nature as well. He says not all social science is created equal. Indeed, almost all of it today is, is bunk. Uh, but I mean, I haven't seen the study, but even just from your description, I can, I already did give you a list of things that could be wrong about your interpretation or wrong about the study or wrong about the base data because it's taking into account too much. And, and, you know, it can take into account 40 years of data, but then it can't be used to make your point because it makes my point that, yes, we have had corrupt and stagnant systems for most of that time, but for the last five years, things have been getting a little better. Just a little. We're still at the early days of, of, of that healing process, but we can see it happening right before our eyes. Patricia says, stupid people have more offspring than smart ones. Leads to an IQ drop. That's a very simplistic way of looking at things. That doesn't tend to be the case uh, in, so I'm not sure if that's actually ever been true that, um, that 
intelligent people have more offspring than stupid people. Um, you would you would often like in the in the Neolithic era, you could have like harems where the leader has all the offspring, um, but they wouldn't necessarily be intelligent. Intelligence is one of many things that is selected for, and in fact, intelligence is not that strongly selected for that far back. The further forward you go, like peasants would fuck like rabbits, and the 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 elites would would have sex only when they could like politically justify it. You know, in some cases. So I don't think that's true at all. Um, but no, the the IQ changes in the West are, in my opinion, almost certainly because of demographic change. And some of those demographics have more children than Westerners because Westerners are so well off. Like they were the most well off people in history, and people that are well off don't have many children. It's a natural uh, adjustment. And again, Patricius, if your main source of concern here is IQ, then I would ask you uh, to to consider expanding your comprehension of of what is useful to people because IQ is one of many factors. IQ is easy to measure. Industriousness, wisdom, uh, uh, experience. Um, uh, charisma, all these things are harder to measure, but very important. And sometimes someone with a uh, low IQ is much more useful than someone with a high IQ. Of course, the individual cases confound even the uh, collective assertions. Even when the collective assertions tend to be true, the individual assertions can make a huge difference. And sometimes a combination of circumstances and low tier traits, low IQ, low charisma, low wisdom can produce a good result. So all kinds of things can confound this. Um, IQ, I don't think even, like, IQ obviously tends towards wealth. It's, it's a good predictor of wealth, partly because IQ is so easy to measure, but there's many other factors um, which are better, in my opinion, better predictors for the quality of a person. I haven't done the study, but that's because you can't measure these things. But just says, why does democracy always coincide with the decline of a civilization? It doesn't. It declines with the, it, so it, it uh, coincides with the rising and falling in both directions. Um, monarchy, uh, coincides with because it, 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 it changes less quickly, so it can be like stable. It can be um, it's less volatile, but it's also less adaptable. It, it doesn't change as frequently, and we need frequent change today because our societies are moving so quickly. So many things are changing. The internet has amplified everything. I'm not sure if there is a tendency of civilizations that collapse being democratic, but it is. Just as possible for, it may actually, it may be, here's an, here's, an, here's an idea. It may be because democracies, I'm not sure about this, this is just an idea, are actually more resistant to corruption than any other system. And thus, people have to work harder to corrupt them. And thus, the methods of corruption they come up with are harder to break because they're harder to perceive. With monarchy, it's easier to perceive them. But also, maybe it's also, it's hard, it's easier to perceive them, but much harder to actually break them. This leads to the conclusion that we need to keep democracy because that allows us to continue developing everything, including our methods for deception. If ever we go out into the universe, find another species, and we have not learned about subversion or normalization propaganda or any of the things that we're learning about, about today, they can dominate our civilization within 50 years. And just as we will have the power to do after this era, if we really want to, and I'm not saying we should, but if we really wanted to, this is a weapon we could use on any other nation. In fact, the part of the reason the US is just so powerful is that it's been using basically this exact weapon on every nation in the world. Maybe the reason the Soviet Union collapsed, maybe the reason communism was defeated is because we use these tools. Our intelligence agencies use these tools on other nations. The, the only difference is now they've turned it in, in interior. So these are useful tools that we have to learn at some point. They're going to be used. They might as well be used by us. But we have to go through the process of learning them and inoculating ourselves to them first. That is how humans learn things. That's how humans adapt to their environment. Deep empiricism by doing it. I'm, I'm not proposing democracy on the basis that me or people like me will be in charge. I'm proposing it with the full awareness that psychopaths will get into positions of power and run the whole thing. But that can be defeated, just like ultimately it could be in monarchy as well. But it is quicker and easier in monarchy, in, sorry, in democracy. Um, but in my opinion, monarchists today are not willing to accept that, monar that monarchies are vulnerable to corruption and even that that corruption can be worse in practice. They are not willing to accept that. Um, very few of them are. And so those of them that think of monarchy as clearly better than democracy, I think that they are envisaging monarchy through 
rose-tinted glasses. Both that's nostalgia, but also idealizing it. Can you imagine for a second, we haven't had in the Western world uh, absolute monarchies in a few hundred years, um, at least not in any of the major countries. Imagine monarchies. So monarchies back then had to deal with a different set of problems than our systems have to today. What if the problems our systems have to deal with today are much worse and more difficult to deal with than what monarchies had to deal with back then? Then even if you were being honest and comparing the best democracies with the best monarchies, it would still be vastly dominant in favor of the best democracies because the problems are harder and yet they're still dealing with them. We have no idea if monarchies, especially in the sense of the absolute or feudalistic monarchy, can even start to deal with the problems we have in the world today. We have no idea. Untested, as far as I know. Now, there may be some, some smaller countries that have done some of that. Um, but again, if they're smaller, if they're less wealthy, they're not dealing with the problems that the leaders of the world are. So I wouldn't be so quick to assume, even if we're okay with you idealizing it, that even the ideal could deal with today. Matthias says, I didn't realize the Roman Empire was a democracy when it fell. It did have democratic elements. I think it had a Senate, didn't it? Or was that, had they suspended that by then and they had an emperor who was the absolute dictator? I can't remember. I mean, they did have democratic elements, yes, but plenty of empires have fallen without having one. He says, Frederick II, for example, had 24 recognized illegitimate sons in Italy alone. Oh, well, m like monarchs will have quite a lot of children. They don't have to be as worried about political considerations, but the courtiers and the, the high class people, they will have to be more considerate of that. And of course, what they do with the children as well is, is, is deeply considered. Like people who have, don't have to worry about having enough money for anything they want to do, don't have to worry about that. And that applies to the king. And that's about it. Even including monarchies and democracies. Even politicians in today's world have to be concerned about it. Billionaires in today's world don't have to worry about money. They, they could have children, though they tend not to. They don't tend to have like gluts of children. Um, perhaps because wealth leads to um, more conservative standards about having children. I'm not sure why, because it could be the other way around. It might be an, uh, uh, an adaptation for humans not to overpopulate or something like that. But Patricia, let me, let me make one thing clear, that the notion of planning sex for the purpose of childbirth and otherwise having sex without the risk of childbirth is a relatively new concept. For most of human history, people had sex because they wanted to, and then children happened. Of course, they knew that there was a connection. As far back as Neolithic times, they knew there was a connection. But a king wasn't thinking too much about, and probably, the one you mentioned probably wasn't thinking too much about, well, should I have sex with this person? It might produce a child. He just wanted to have sex with them. And because he was a king, he did it. He doesn't sound like, uh, he, doesn't sound like he was a particularly responsible ruler, but he might have been. Maybe he wasn't spending all his time banging milkmaids. We don't know. I mean, I don't know. But yeah, I, like this is the, the whole conversation about number of children is premised on your case that IQ is, it seem, you seem to say that it's supremely important, but it's, it's not. And also you're talking about one person in the system. He says he likely have to have up to 100 children. How many, but again, we're a K-type civilization, a K-type species. Having 100 children, that's too many. You can't give each of them the guidance they need. I bet most of them were either failures or successes despite the king being their father, um, which means they probably weren't particularly fond of the king or were not um, particularly worthy to be rulers. So most of those, were, I'm not going to say wasted, but if they had been had by other people who would have therefore had a mother and a father and an extended family and a community around them, they might have ended up being better adjusted children. It's not necessarily like it's because of the assumption that you're selecting for something useful if they're the leader, but you're not always. Again, an illegitimate or an um, um, uh, unworthy king may still have hundreds of children. It's a very approximate selection mechanism. These days, we do our eugenic selection independently, and it actually works better, I think. People can choose who, who to be with and how many children to have. Um, generally, when you give people choices like that, when you let them figure it out for themselves, same thing with, with capitalism. When you let them figure it out for themselves, they will find the right answers. It's sort of a, 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 a desperation move to have to arbitrate that. Um, and in the past, people were more desperate. I found that interesting. 